Good morning. I was going to call you Wreckers, but it sounds like Wreckers, so we'll call you Reckoners. So good morning, Reckoners. <laughs> Um, uh, I called this, uh, John uh, turned around and said, I'd like you to do a presentation. Now, usually I do this for work because you'll be with, um, I'm a remote employee in a remote office, uh, which uh, the equivalent sometimes makes me that of data protection Yoda. I'm, uh, I live in a very green country where it rains a lot. <laughs> and people come to me for wisdom every now and then. Or most times I get in a plane and fly to them. Uh, so when I was looking at doing this, I decided, uh, John asked me, how do you get things done in a big company? Well, I decided to call it, you know, getting things done inside a big company, what little I know. Because over time, the smarter I've gotten, the dumber I feel. That's pretty much how things are. You realize, you, 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 start, you start into your IT career, uh, you're fresh-faced or not, depending on when you jump in, um, and soon you realize that uh, you had every answer and then you realize you have no answers and you have to go off and discover them. Uh, I have found in my career as you move along and other people find in theirs, you believe that people above you have the plan until you climb up and up and up and you realize people are looking at you to have the plan. I think there's a lot of people in this room where you're assumed to have the plan. Quite important. Uh, what we'll start with is John asked for a, a picture of a cute animal. There you go. <laughs> right. Now, nothing political, but look at it. Look at that. Look at that countenance, right? Look at the, the leonine mane, the hooded eyes, the lips, like Caligula, right? And I like, to refer, I like to actually do the scientific genus, and I probably spelled it wrong, is Dijavasaurus rex, right? Do you consider that <laughs> Dijavasaurus rex? I do have a point in this besides the cute family. I was reading a very interesting article in Bloomberg about Trump's company, and you realize it pretty much is a family-run organization. He pretty much does all the running. Donald is dad, and he makes all the decisions. Uh, that works where you are the brand and you are the company. Uh, it doesn't work uh, uh, so much when you begin scaling out, when you begin scaling a large organization. I mean, with this model, it'll only ever get so, uh, so large, and chances are, when he, do, when he passes away, uh, the organization will go into a level of decline. That's the thing about leaders. It's the thing about large organizations. Uh, you can have good leaders in organizations. Unfortunately, the organization will get worse when they move on. That's just a natural thing. Uh, good leaders build good teams. Good teams without good leaders disintegrate. The people go off and find new leaders to go do new and interesting things. Alfred Sloan, um, big shot CEO, that's what he was. He birthed the modern corporation. The modern cor uh, silo uh, corporation as we know today. He, was, uh, he wasn't the founder, but he was one of the first uh, CEOs of General Motors. Um, he took uh, uh, General Motors, which was a collection of acquisitions, which was way behind the Ford Motor Company, which just had one or two models at the time. They had about, like GM had anywhere between eight to 12 uh, different brands of cars. And they had somewhere to the order of 12, 13% market share, well behind Ford. What Sloan did through management, through building the management silo, he did not develop the siloed organization. Uh, he did not develop the idea of the silo organization. He did perfect it. And therefore, he birthed the idea of the 20th century company. So Sloan uh, turned around, organized his company into silos, uh, uh, came up with price models, made sure that no matter who you were, you could afford a, a, a General Motors car. Now, if you were um, the president of a company, you were buying a Cadillac, right? If you were a general employee, you were buying something much more affordable. But this allowed him to propel um, Gen, uh, GM to one of the most powerful, most valuable corporations at the time. And just when I talk about leadership decline, uh, the decline of GM probably did start when Sloan passed on, when he moved on into history. Uh, this uh, lovely model that he had actually built uh, turned around and began moving uh, into uh, moving into the middle. All these different price bands that the uh, that the company had, they all began. Uh, th those walls began breaking down, and people started chasing after the same customers. And we we know how that turned out, especially here in America. Um, you ended up bailing out that company, right? You ended up bailing out that company. So if you're inside a siloed organization, um, you can survive and you can indeed thrive. I've done it myself for a significant amount of time. Um, how do you do that? Well, how do you thrive in a managed silo? Be yourself. No. Don't do that. <laughs> Be anything but yourself. I've met some of you. You're terrible people. <laughs> You're horrible, horrible people. But. <laughs> 
but be yourself. You can be yourself to an extent. It's great to have personality. I have personality. How I got away with a lot of the stuff that I got away with is that people found me humorous. You know? I, I was funny. Not, fun, not that funny because you'll still get stepped on. Um, it, it was funny. But the one skill that I did learn, I, lear I learned it through observation, not through research. And as you do more research, you see how apparent it is. If you want to thrive in a siloed organization, if you're not an individual contributor where you are master of your own destiny, and even I, as a remote employee in a remote office, was some way a master of my own destiny, but in order to get things done inside of a large organization, you build teams. But you build teams even if other people don't know they're in your team, right? So you build stealth teams if it comes down to it. I use the Justice League, which is the worst example of a team, which I'll explain why later. <laughs> But um, so a team is when two or more people define themselves as member of it and the existence is recognized by one other. Isn't that great? You need three people, you got yourself a team. Uh, so Dunbar's number. Uh, Dunbar's number is interesting. Dunbar's number is what initially taught me that you have too many Facebook friends and Facebook knows you have too many Facebook friends. Dunbar's number, which is 150 people, 150 members, at that rate, you spend 42% of your time just on maintaining your social connections. So above that, you have thousands of friends, Facebook have all these algorithms to slim down everything that you see from them, prevent you from being overwhelmed. And you wonder why, why aren't I hearing from this person or that person anymore? Because Facebook's algorithm is applying things like Dunbar's number to slim down the number of connections so you'll actually keep on coming back and won't feel, feel overwhelmed by the amount of maintenance and work you need to do. And the optimum size for any team is 10 members. 10 or less, right? Uh, you're, if you ever go to a meeting, there's a significant amount of people there, um, and there, no decision has been made as a result of that meeting, you have wasted your time. Now, you're listening to me, and I appreciate that very much, uh, but the thing, what you won't be able to buy is time. Uh, people come into a meeting with me, I pretty much start the stop clock. I'm nasty that way, right? And I make sure it chimes when their time is done, and then I just glare at them until they leave. Right? So... <laughs> Right? So, the thing about a team, and we were discussing this earlier, is that groups um, have more information, they can make better decisions. Right? Individuals can make good decisions, but they can make better decisions. I do have a caution on that, which we'll actually get into. Uh, there's one or, uh, one or two unhealthy behaviors which you can actually get in a group. But I found, when, anytime I want to get anything done, inside EMC, blogging, let's start blogging. I put together a bunch of people, we were, well, I didn't put it together, we came together, we were an informal team. While that number was small, things were great. When it got to hundreds and hundreds of people, I became less interested and so did everyone else and people started checking out and all things like that. When you keep the team small, you can get stuff done if, you've right, if you have the right people in the team. Stages of group development. This is uh, uh, the Tuckman model it's referred to. Um, forming, storming, norming, performing. There's adjourning, transforming, and you can put renorming in there as well. It's a mess, complete mess. Uh, Forming is when you actually get people together and you define what it is you're, you're looking to do and whether or not you can work with these people. Uh, there is a research out there uh, about uh, diversity in teams, you know, very important, diverse teams. Uh, they, uh, they come out with um, a better results in the long term. This is true. Unfortunately, they take longer to form and storm because you need a common point of view in order to make, move forward with people. So while they can actually, no, while they do actually produce uh, better results, it takes a lot more time to get things moving. But it's, it's important, it's worthwhile. Uh, the storming part is where everyone fights for what their job is going to be inside the team. Right? Someone who is either leading the meeting, someone who's getting things done, someone who's sitting on people to make sure that things arrive in time. It's, it's, um, it, it, it's where you define all that. Norming is where everything calms down. You've done the storming part, everything is calmed down. Performing is you're actually generating useful stuff, right? So your team is actually generating useful things. Um, what happens then is that goes on for a bit and then circumstances change on you. And then you need to turn around and you need to transform, go back to the forming stage, take these new situations, new circumstances. Maybe someone's been laid off, um, maybe you, someone's been hired in, uh, maybe uh, you know, the product you're working on has been cancelled. Maybe someone has said, no, the product you're working on, we're going to expand what, uh, your, your remit and you have two weeks to let us know how you, you, how you can do this. 90 days inside a corporation, it's usually the 90 day turn. If you need something done, you get, I need 90 days. A lot of time you don't get 90 days. You get a month, right? Now, when you're doing inside the 
organization, you get a month. Those are the stages of group development. The first two are where the majority of, of projects fall to pieces because the team uh, gets together, it is unhealthy, it doesn't work, people split into two, they turn their agendas against one another, things fall apart. Any examination I've ever done, and sometimes it's like alien autopsy, of why important projects have failed, you will find it in the forming and storming phase where people have just decided, well, I don't agree with what you're doing, I am going my own way. They work against each other, things collapse. Apollo syndrome. Apollo was, and I talk about groups and teams and unhealthy behavior, Apollo was uh, uh, one of the gods of, uh, of the sun, of music, of medicine. It was a polymath god, understood an awful lot of things. A lot, some people in this room, some people on the live stream, are polymaths. They have a level of experience across entirely different fields. And what happens is that if you take all these all-stars together, the team underperforms because they immediately go to war against each other. This is a scientific principle, it's examined, it is repeatable, right? We know it exists. When companies say, I'm going to put together an all-star team, what you do is you look at them, you do not join. You say, good luck with that. And you go off, you form a real team because you're going to have to make the save, right? I use the, yeah. <laughs> look, it's all about self-promotion. This is how I've survived. Um, the, the entire uh, thing, when, I, when it comes to that, I used the Justice League earlier. You got Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman on the one team. They're not going to work with one another. You know, they'll lead their own bloody teams. You get three times the work done, right? Instead of hanging around arguing the point. But that's, uh, that's Apollo syndrome. You take the all-stars, you put them together. They're not in the right place. They'll just annihilate one another. It'll be agony to work on the team. We know with type A personalities and performers, you can't have too many of those on. Uh, in, in the uh, one team uh, because things start, uh, things start going a bit crazy when they battle each other for supremacy. Um, that's a group thing. I talked about a team, well, you know, none of us is as dumb as all of us, right? You get together in a meeting. Um, the, the whole thing about that is this will be an example of bad behavior. This will be an example of making the bad decisions. If a team turns inward, right? and starts making calls that we know how things uh, should be done, we're doing it this way, that's a bad team. You end up with group think. Um, if you ever look at a team that doesn't have someone, at least one team member, one to 10, that's running out continuously looking for new information and bringing things back and new ideas to be discussed and the problem to be uh, decided and broken down, that's a, you got yourself a bad team. You're in the wrong, you're in the wrong place. Uh, group think is an uh, absolute killer uh, for teams. I did do the meeting discussion earlier. If you're ever part of a meeting where a decision isn't made, do not go back to that meeting again. It's a waste of your time. If you're in a meeting where they look at a complex problem and they say, whoa, that's really complex. We should put people on this to have a look at it. What you don't want to hear is someone pipe up from the back, which can happen. Um, yet this is the meeting to look at that problem. Stop kicking this can down the road. What are you doing? Someone has to make a decision. That's what it means to be a leader. My boss has an, a, a, a description if you see, a, 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 of this. If you see a pile of crap, grab a shovel, right? Don't go, look at that, and walk on. <laughs> Virtual teams, and we're nearly done. Virtual teams is, are, are, are pretty much, we talk about remote employees. The good news is that you're all part of virtual teams. We now have the technology where people in the same campus um, will not get up and go meet one another. They will send each other messages, they will send each other emails, they will send each other phone calls. One of the things I found a, a unusual uh, when I actually uh, w would go back to a, a large campus is I would go looking for people and um, because I want to discuss this, I want to discuss that because usually if I want to speak to anyone, you know, I look out the window at the birdies in the home office or something but um, and talk to myself and they talk back. Um, but the, the, if you want to go, I have to reach out and, and discuss via uh, the various communication channels that I'd have with uh, different people. I land, I'd come in, I'd get in a car, I'd go to the campus, and I'd speak to someone, I'd speak to someone else, I'd speak to someone else, and you'd find that a lot of these people, though they're on the same campus, have never spoken to one another. They're all isolated, they're all part of a virtual team. I do think as a remote employee, you develop the skills to have to reach out to get things. Uh, the people who end up sitting there and, go, uh, uh, um, and have things to, um, to do and, 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 and so on, they don't, they don't reach out as much, and they should. Um, how good a virtual employee you are is, is down to you and how good, uh, um, how good a virtual employee you are and how good a virtual manager your, your manager is, uh, what I left off down that, is pretty much down to you. Right? So that's the mirror from Snow White, in case you don't know what that is. It's the mirror from Snow White. Um, 
it, it's pretty well, if you're, uh, you can be a good virtual employee uh, you, you are, and even a good remote employee. You have to be a self-starter. Uh, micromanagement isn't a thing for you. If someone's standing over you asking for things to be done, if you decide, like, my work day does not uh, shut, uh, it does not finish at 5, it does not finish at 5 p.m., sometimes you go to company campuses and come 5 o'clock, you're like the last, you might as well be there at midnight, building is, people moved on and moved out. Uh, but um, it, it comes down to how good you, and how good your manager is, you know, how much trust they actually put in you, how they manage you, are they available, are they open? Uh, modern uh, communications technology does have us doing an awful lot uh, less face-to-face. -face. I do text and instant message with people like I was a 14-year-old girl, right? That's pretty much, it's all the time, it's just a blizzard of these little messaging snowflakes, uh, be it iMessage, SMS, Twitter direct messages, that's how we organize this, right? Twitter direct messages, uh, email, you know, all these impersonal face-to-face -face things. Anytime anyone wants me to use video, there's a bit of a, Ugh, you know, it's like, oh God, I'll have to shave. You know, and, do, and do things like that, or put on clothing, right? Because <laughs> so, party in my house, but um, but uh, you have to end up having to do those things. But even people sitting in the same location, and I discuss this about people who don't discuss with one another, they use very much impersonal communication. Now, the absence of non-verbal cues, the ability to look at uh, one another, look at each other straight in the eye and try and perceive what someone else is thinking does affect groups. It makes team formation for virtual teams an awful lot more difficult, which means uh, uh, sometimes I'm willing to get in a plane, fly somewhere to get into a room to sit down with someone and just build the trust form of the relationship to get things moving. You have to do that. You don't do that, it won't happen. Now, Lack of cues and messages makes people uninhibited, increases uh, the sense of anonymity, which can, uh, uh, which can equalize status and participation, but it does increase hostility and conflict. I am not talking about Twitter. Right, you go on Twitter, people say, you're a dirtbag, I hate you, how, you can, how can you believe that? That was just my acts this morning, right, never mind anything else, right, you win that. There's like all these hand-wringing um, articles out there about how much uh, crueler people are online because they're anonymous. People have been cruel to one another the same way. It's like saying murder has gotten worse since video games. No, murder got worse when one person picked up a rock and beat the other person to death for the first time, right? That was murder get, uh, getting worse. But when we talk about the lack of empathy, um, this, is, this is a known behavior. This goes back to 1986, right? When God knows what messaging people were using back then. It wasn't AIM or ICQ because they came later, right? But it, it, it's that lack of empathy that's out there. That's always been there. We're always going to have it. If you ever uh, jump into um, uh, a, a, a medium where there isn't some form of face-to-face -face communication, you can expect to get shit on by someone eventually. <laughs> it's only a matter of time. So to conclude, because I hate doing slides, so I only did 10 of them. Right. Um, to conclude, if you want to get things done ins inside a large company, regardless of where you are, you have to go through the Tuckman model, right? You have to go through that. You will learn it yourself naturally if you're effective. If you're not effective naturally, you'll put it together. You're going to have to sit down with people. You're going to have to display empathy. You're going to have to be available at all different times, right? You're, you're going to just have to be present. Uh, and this sounds very new agey and self helpy But you have to push further the further away you are from the core. You have to do more because the, the energy falls off the, uh, as further away as you are. But if you have that, if you have the empathy, if you're willing to put teams together, you're willing to work hard on those teams, hold them together, go through the, uh, the trials and tribulations, you will be successful. Your success, your success will be noticed, usually by someone who's stealing the credit. But nonetheless, it will be noticed, and you will do fine. And I always discussed time. I'd like to give you some back, so thank you for yours. Thank <laughs> you.